please welcome Pete Cashmore, founder of Mashable, in conversation with Roya Maboub, digital entrepreneur, and Rika Parkari, chief information officer at the World Food Program, and Ben Siegel, global social impact project and partnership lead at Consensus. All right. <clears throat> so today we're going to be talking a little bit about blockchain and how it can be used for good. Um, I think before we get into all that, I'd probably like to start with um, Roy. I used to have an incredible story about how you got all the way into using Bitcoin and blockchain. So maybe we'll just start there and then we'll get into definitions. Sure. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about your life story and how you ended up in technology and then into using blockchain and Bitcoin? Sure. Thank you for having me here. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here. Um, how I started, I guess that I was uh, in Afghanistan at the time. I was uh, 16 years old and uh, living uh, at that time, it was like you living in darkness because you didn't have any access to information. And the only things that we could see is there was only one library in Herat that you have to go there and you could see all the old books and there was no any updated. And the only information we could get, it was a TV that you could see the news. And I was here that there was an internet cafe uh, was open up in Herat, and I was here that there is a magic box there that you can connect you with the world, and uh, you can talk with the people without meeting with them. And as well, it's allow you that when you type anything, type anything, you can find any information you want. And I really wanted to go there, but there was only men could go there, like my brothers and cousins could go there, but it wasn't appropriate for the girls in 2003 to go to Indian Cafe. But I was insisted, and I was at that time was very shy girl, but I really wanted to go there. So I was there. one day I was allowed to go early in the morning, and I think that for the first time when I was using the internet and the computer, it was open my eyes to the wider world, and I find that there are many realities that I don't know, and that's why I get interested in computer science. I went to faculty and I graduated, and I started my business in 2010. And at that time, in 2011, I got investment, and then we built a platform uh, called Women and X that allowed the women to write the blogs and they can upload the information. And we pay them based on the content that they provide for us. Mm -hmm. And the number of these users get increased, but the problem was is that how we can pay them. And um, when the monies come to my bank account, I have to go with my colleagues to the bank because it was a lot of money and uh, there were lots of tips at that time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I, um, so I have to protect myself to get the monies from the bank. And then we have to distribute it to every of these women because they didn't have a bank account. And uh, distribution also was a very difficult job because someone says, oh, I didn't receive my money or it was less or blah, blah. And that was uh, another challenge for us. So we decided to find different ways. And uh, because the girls, most of them didn't have a bank account or they didn't have their family's permission or they couldn't go to the bank to open up. So we decided to find different ways. Then we come up with an idea of m -Pace. There was a mobile money that mm -hmm. you could get uh, paid. But it was, again, was expensive things because they, it was, um, at, at the time, it wasn't working hard, and then also another problem is that it was still expensive for exchange uh, of the money. And then we look at the PayPal, but PayPal didn't work in Afghanistan, so we didn't know how to do it. And then the number of uh, users was increasing in different parts of the province in Afghanistan. It was so difficult to pay them. And uh, then my former business partner, Francesco, sent me an article about Bitcoin, and he says, what do you think about this? And I said, well, this is not the money. <laughs> Because Afghans, we believe that we have to tie something physical that is called money. And then, um, but then he keeps sending the articles and say that maybe this is a good thing that we start. And then when I started more, I found that Bitcoins is very similar to our Havala system and Sarafi. Mm -hmm. It's all based on the trust. <coughs> and uh, we have Sarafi in Afghanistan that is the biggest, like 70% of all the transactions still happen through the Havala system right. and Sarafi. So it was good, but the only thing is that I have to convince my people and my employees that this is digital version of that <laughs> or how all that. And that's how we get involved with Bitcoins. Great, that's, that's an incredible story. I'd love to, Amrika, I'd love to get you involved. How did you find your way to, uh, to using blockchain, the World Food Program? 
Right. So we started using blockchain, the World Food Program, as uh, uh, you know, with this distributed ledger, you to 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 transfer uh, money to our uh, beneficiaries. So we started in Pakistan, and then quickly moved to serving um, refugees, um, you know, at, out of Syria in the camps in Jordan. So imagine um, you're you're in Syria, war breaks out, you lose everything. You have no home, you have no title of education, you have no nothing, you just have to walk and cross and look for safety. You arrive in a camp in Jordan where um, you, you, know, you just, you lost. And so what we did, we tried to restore uh, their, their dignity, their identity, their ability to rebuild their life. I'm telling you this because the reason we, we started underlying technology to be able to do that. So now refugees can go to um, a retailers. They can be identified using retina scan, so they don't have to show anything. They don't have to um, put even, you know, they don't, they don't have to own anything in their hands. They can just be recognized and their um, identity gets validated immediately into our blockchain um, instance, and which then allows them to be identified and to, and to know how much money they have available in their account. And that the retailers, basically at the, ca at the cashier, they go and, you know, and redeem uh, whatever they want to buy. So what this does, it gives them back the, uh, the dignity of choosing their own food, so not being handed out food, they go shopping like they used to do in their markets back in their country. Their identity is assured. And, uh, uh, and the transaction is written directly into our blockchain instance, and therefore in this way, we disintermediate banks, which is also create enormous efficiencies uh, in our, uh, in our uh, supply chain and therefore reduces the cost. And on top of that, we're doing this also to continuously guarantee the safety and security of the individuals. These are the furthest behind. These are people who are extremely vulnerable, and we want to make sure that their identity are not shared with, the, uh, with entities outside of the trusted network of the, United, of the United Nations as far as we can. So their identities are no longer shared with banks, which they, did, they used to do before. So we see a lot of values in uh, uh, disruptive technologies in, uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in this environment. Mm. Uh, it's still at the beginning, but I think we're seeing great potentials in the, okay. in the use of it. Ben, your job at Consensus is to explain blockchain, convince NGOs, governments, humanitarian organizations, everyone to get involved. Can you maybe start with us? I would assume you know, most people in the room have kind of heard of blockchain. Why is it better? Why should people be getting involved with it? Um, and then maybe after that, you can maybe cite some examples. Is that an easy question for you? Uh, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> so, I mean, the best place to start is probably ancient Samaria. Um, Hear me out. So if we think about we nine minutes left. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I was almost a history professor, and then this is like my weird transition into blockchain. Um, so if we think about like specifically the way that value moves through the economy, mm -hmm. um, like ledgers control value flow, and the people who control ledgers control value flow. The first recorded piece of information in human history is an ancient Sumerian tablet that in cuneiform says, you know he or she owns 150 bushels of wheat, and that's a ledger. And those ledgers have been controlling our economy for you know, 7,000 years now. And over time, the skill set that was required to control those ledgers became more and more complex. The ledgers became more complicated. We started moving from 150 bushels of wheat into millions and millions and billions and trillions of dollars of value, flowing from America to Vietnam to Pakistan to Chile, all over the world, um, all controlled by the ledgers. And of course, the people who control the ledgers control the value. That's an incredible amount of value. Um, and then beyond that, like every, the way that we all interact with each other is also controlled by ledgers. So your Facebook account, your debit card, your credit card, your passport, your, uh, your driver's license, each one of those is a point on a ledger that controls your access to information or your access to value or your access to movement, whatever it is. The people who control those ledgers control you. Um, in the concept of the economy, it's bankers, lawyers, and accountants for the most part. So come 2009, 2008, uh, economic collapse, bankers, lawyers, and accountants, maybe we're to blame for that. Um, we won't point any fingers. Uh, and then you kind of get this magical white paper that shows up on the internet that outlines a way in which we can disintermediate the ledgers. So we can take and 
you know, the bankers, lawyers, and accountants who are responsible for controlling the ledgers, and we have to pay them to update it, and we can remove them from the system, and we can build ledgers that we can connect with each other through cryptographic, you know, methodology and, and hashing algorithms and build Bitcoin. Like, that's what Bitcoin is. It's a way to uh, move value from point A to point B without needing those bankers, lawyers, and accountants who drain value from it. Um, so just really quickly to, like, reinforce this concept, can everyone just hold up their hands? All right. Everyone's holding a magic piece of paper. I'm gonna write on my magic piece of paper, my name is Ben, and that's gonna show up on all of your pieces of paper. It's write only. None of you can delete that from your piece of paper. We all have to agree to the rules that govern the addition of information to that piece of paper, but once I write something on it and it's validated by all of your hands, pieces of paper, it's gonna show up on everyone. And if we wanna change that information, we're not deleting it, we're just updating the state. So if we agree through consensus um, that my name is no longer Ben and we change my name to Mike, that's gonna be reflected as a state change on the ledger. But all of us have access to that ledger and we can control the, we can, we can add to it and we can see what's been added to it. Um, and that's why we talk about trust and transparency and disintermediation in the blockchain space. Okay, I'm gonna hop to Enrique really quick because I think w w the question that raises is why is that better, for instance, for refugees um, than a traditional database? Why would we want all the information to be distributed? For the trust that Ben was talking about, um, again, imagine a, a database where the identities of Okay. Extremely vulnerable people are kept in the hands of one person, or one she voice. She looks so familiar. Do you know what her name is? Oh, she is? No, she does look incredibly familiar, though, doesn't she? I know. I'm like... A little, uh... It's, it's my alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, it's two of me here. That's like uh, one body, two people. That's, that's... <laughs> but there's no consensus about it. <laughs> so I don't agree with whatever she said. <laughs> so... And I think that's where we see the value. The, the value is in the, in the trust, the transparency. The, it doesn't belong, you know, it's not in the hands of only one individual or one mm -hmm. group, but it's, it's distributed. Oh, good. Therefore, Get you out of here at a decent time. <laughs> she really does not agree with something. <laughs> oh, I love cancel. Okay. <laughs> There's someone behind me. Sorry. <laughs> There is no one behind. So, um, and it's, it's the same thing. I love canceling on things. I think we should invite her here. I know, it sounds like an interesting conversation. Yeah. Whoever you are, please come and sit here. I won't show us. Okay, so it's not working. She didn't. Maybe if I no. feel really. <laughs> <laughs> this is turning out to be a really funny. I don't think they know. Don't think they know. I don't think they know. Maybe just continue. <laughs> they do know. They do know. <laughs> Not only this is a very interesting session, it's Make also it. extremely it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the funniest one so far. We planned, we planned it well, didn't we? We surprised you. So it's about, maybe I'll, so until the other guest comes in, let me say, it's the, it's the trust, is the, is the fact that we don't want the, you know, we, like, we see the opportunities of the, all this extremely valuable and sensitive information not to be in the hands of one or two or three people that you need to trust. But the trust is in all of us. As again, is all, as Ben said, is, at this, is distributed. Mm -hmm. And I think if we see this as a real value for, uh, for the security. And what about people? the kind of the resilience of that as well? You're talking about areas well, that might be affected by natural right. disasters. You're talking about people who might lose their homes. They might have important paperwork in their homes. So presumably this continues. It always exists. It's hard to destroy. Exactly. We're talking about individuals who are extremely vulnerable, who live in very fragile environments. While you and I are used to knowing where to get our information, where to trust, um, in fragile environments like those, I think that a technology like a distributed ledger would allow them to retain their information even if they are state to their country, it wasn't. don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you start looking at 
going back to why not only a simple database, a simple database could have disintermediated banks, great in efficiency cost, but it doesn't allow that collaboration, the sharing across, you know, putting the beneficiary at the center and him or her owning her own information and being appended to her identity throughout their life. So if, uh, you know, if the, if the home that they had or the state that they belong to exists no more, still the information is there. And I think that, that you know, starts building a trust with the individuals and a resilience for, on, for what they own, which at mm -hmm. times is title of their properties, is information about their education, their vaccinations, uh, and, and anything that they had that it could be digitized stays with them. And I think at that, the value is, is extraordinary. So, so you're thinking of expanding that maybe beyond just, hey, we're going to use this to distribute food, but as a, as a core identity system on the blockchain. Absolutely. Got Absolutely. it. Um, Roy, you've been using cryptocurrency. So the World Food Program's using uh, cryptography as basically an identity system. Can you talk a little, and I know you kind of hinted at it with regard to security and those kind of things. Why is that uh, better for the unbanked? Uh, why, why is cryptocurrency just a better system than uh, trying to, you know, convince people to sign up for bank accounts and that kind of thing? Uh, well, I think that I will get back to the work that we done for Afghanistan for women. I think that was a much better place because many of the women didn't have access to the bank or they didn't have the permission to have a bank mm -hmm. account uh, by their families, not by law. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other problem is, was that. Um, there is like in a few years ago, one of the very big uh, private bank account in Afghanistan, they bankrupt and they stole a lot of the monies of the mm -hmm. people. That's how the people lost their trust to the banking system and they want to use the Sarofi because it was much more uh, secure and they are more trustable. And I, but I think it's still with the Sarofi, still you have a challenges because you needed to find a person to get your money. But when you don't, when you have the money in your wallet, only you know how much money you mm -hmm. have. It. And you can go anywhere in part of the world and there is no needed to have that person or you go to the bank to get your money. For example, I just go back to the refugee. Uh, we had some of the, our employees that they left it in the refugee cross in 2015 uh, to Europe. And uh, they're telling me the stories that how those uh, mafia that they're taking these people, they're taking their jewelries, their monies, in the way that they're taking them to Germany and they lost everything. So they couldn't go back to Afghanistan to get their monies and they can't, uh, they didn't have anything. And one of these students had only one Bitcoin or two Bitcoins, uh, she kept it uh, in her wallet. And uh, at the time of 2015, it's still the month and the price of the Bitcoin was low. low. But once it goes up, then she could sold it out. And she told me that I wish that I could uh, make all of my money on everything that we had in Bitcoins when we left in Afghanistan because lots of the people stolen uh, taking their monies. And more importantly, women, and not only women, everyone's in the on development uh, and uh, those places that they don't have bank account, they can have their uh, financial independence. So they mm -hmm. have their owner and there is no any middleman, there is no anyone that uh, take, take the monies from them. So I think that's the beauty of hmm. the, the Bitcoin. It's incredibly empowering. It's almost like you own your own bank in a way and no one can take that from you. Ben, I know we're about at time, but I just want to get in one more from you. Give us some other examples of how blockchain is being used for good, because I know you work with a lot of orgs. One of the ones I'm really interested in is the WWF and illegal phishing. So maybe you just give us you know, cool. 30 seconds on that. I'll give two really fast ones. So WWF, um, at Consensus, we have a platform called Viant, which is a supply chain management platform. Viant? Viant, okay. V-I-A-N-T. Um, they just put out a great case study about this case. But what they've been doing with the World Wildlife Fund uh, off the coast of Fiji is basically bait to plate fishing. So um, there's a huge amount of overfishing and illegal fishing that's done off the coast of Fiji. And what happens there, um, I mean, not only is overfishing bad because we want to protect the sanctity of life in the ocean and we want there to be fish, but also the vast majority of uh, illegal fishing is done with slave labor. So what we've been able to do is actually create a system that allows for proper verification that if you are selling your fish, you have a license, meaning you are not using slave labor in the fishing market. Uh, and this is empowering for a number of reasons. One, uh, it opens up new markets. So if there are concerns about slave labor in your <laughs> on your fishing boat or in your supply chain, then you probably can't sell to a vast majority of places. Um, it also cuts down on slave labor because you're killing the market for fish that are fished with, so using slave labor is no longer profitable. 
Um, <laughs> and the way that this is done is that when the fish are pulled out of the ocean, they are attached to an RFID scanner, or an RFID scanner is attached to the fish. The RFID scanner is much smaller than the fish. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's pinned to the fish, and then that, uh, basically the signature of that RFID scanner is hashed onto the blockchain. So when it shows up to the, the market or the marketplace, wherever it's being sold or the first vendor, they check the hash. And if the hashes match, does anyone know what a hash is? Am I just like? Yeah, this may get a little bit. <laughs> this may, uh, if you take a number, a set of data or an image or something, and you input it through a hashing algorithm, it's a mathematical algorithm that produces a string of letters and numbers um, that are. They basically identify that data, but they do not represent that data. So if anything is changed in that data, you'll get a different hash. So it makes it really, really easy to tell if something's been tampered with or it doesn't exist the way it's supposed to. Um, so in this case, the, basically the data shows up, uh, at, uh, you know, you rehash it when it gets to the vendor, and if the hash is matched, then that fish was legally sourced. If the hashes don't match, then you go arrest the fishermen because they're fishing illegally. Um, and then we actually just on Monday demoed something similar using hashes for data integrity. Um, so we've been working for the past six months to secure data that's been pulled out of um, a network of IoT sensors, human reporters, and social media scrubbers in Syria to start to hold war criminals accountable mm -hmm. there um, by hashing and creating validation that the information that's being pulled is correct and accurate. Well, you know, and I think what's really exciting about blockchain is it kind of reminds me of, you know, when we started Social Good Summit about it's about empowering people. Technology is about putting the tools into people people's hands and then uh, kind of disintermediating so that they can uh, run their own lives. And uh, I think that's just what's fantastic about blockchain. So I thank all of you for coming and our bonus panelists, wherever she may be. Um, I'm sorry that you have to cancel on a lot of stuff, but uh, uh, thanks so much, guys. Thank Appreciate it. <laughs>